Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Dan Meyer. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of RCR Wireless News. Thanks for joining us today. Today I am joined by uh, Trey Hanbury, who's the uh, partner at uh, Lovell's, Lovell's sorry, Washington, D.C. office and uh, a member of the uh, technology, media, and telecom practice there at Hogan Lovell. Uh, Trey, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Great, great. Well, uh, the topic for today uh, is going to be looking ahead uh, a bit at the uh, upcoming, hopefully upcoming, uh, 600 megahertz incentive auction, which is uh, highly anticipated across the mobile space. Uh, a lot of companies are preparing for it. But uh, before we get to the actual process of the, of the auction itself, which is scheduled for middle of next year, uh, there are a, a lot of issues that the FCC needs to uh, still work through uh, to make this thing actually happen. And uh, hopefully to get to, from Trey here some insight into what's going on uh, in the near term as the FCC is looking at some important decisions coming up over the past, over the next month uh, to kind of get this thing uh, going. And obviously, uh, Trey, this is a uh, one of those uh, processes which, I mean, in general, auctions are complicated, uh, but this one here seems to be uh, extra complicated from, from the FCC perspective, the way they're handling it with the, with the, with the reverse auction and, uh, and getting broadcasters involved. So maybe just, uh, maybe just start off with just your general view of how the process has gone to this point when it comes to uh, getting this process moving uh, from the FCC's perspective. Sure. I, I think the FCC really hit the ground running with uh, the order, it's a, it's a very comprehensive order. It's more than 400 pages long. It's got, uh, I, I've lost track of how many footnotes, uh, 2,400 footnotes or in excess of 2,400 footnotes. So it's quite detailed and it provides a really solid foundation for what is yet to come. The, um, the basic outlines are unlike any other auction the FCC's ever conducted. It's got the forward auction and the reverse auction. The reverse auction, they'll offer a broadcaster a high price and then lower that price. They'll drop out if it's too low. And the forward auction is going to look very much like any other spectrum auction, but with lots of different twists. Yeah. And there are about seven major proceedings that this has spawned, and the FCC will have to get through each of those. A lot of them have to deal with the details of interference between different services that will be in the band. Others have to deal deal with incumbent services that are there now, like wireless microphones and how those will be accommodated. And you've probably heard from, from uh, that community as well. The other part is uh, typical in a forward auction notice and often a very humdrum kind of affair. It's called a comment public notice where they seek guidance on auction mechanics. How fast can we raise the minimum price, uh, minimum bid at each round? Um, what are the activity rules for bidders? How do the mechanics of the auction rules work with respect to stopping or reserve prices or some of these other factors? And I think that of all of the proceedings, all these seven proceedings, a lot of which are very technical in nature or address uh, incumbent issues or low power television, the one to watch in my view is really the comment public notice yeah. because even though it's a humdrum affair in most auctions, this isn't most auctions. And it's that comment public notice that's going to be really important and, and create a lot of rules that will be first of their kind for an auction of this sort. Yeah, yeah. obviously the comment period, uh, you know, I, I, I doubt it will probably quite reach the, the number that perhaps net neutrality has garnered in terms of uh, comments to the FCC, but uh, I'm guessing it will be pretty close. Uh, no, we will never. Be, uh, <laughs> thankfully, we will never bring down the FCC server. A lot of these rules are very arcane, but there's a small cottage industry of consultants and economists and engineers and lawyers that are really thinking hard about how these rules are structured. Because depending on the reserve price that's set, the bidding rounds that are that are conducted and how those are conducted, the upfront payments that are established. Yeah. All of that could greatly influence the outcome of the auction. Yeah. So um, it's it's incredibly important, but they, the rules themselves may seem um, arcane to an outside observer, but it's a novel and unique opportunity. So there's a, there's a lot of people who will be watching that comment public notice once it comes out very closely. Of course, there are other hurdles that the FCC has got to overcome as well. You've got uh, two different entities so far who have, uh, challenged the FCC's set of auction order, the National Association of Broadcasters and uh, Sinclair, yeah. both of whom have uh, sued the FCC. Those suits have been joined. Four parties have intervened. It's actually a, a very extensive lineup of, of interventions, all in support of the FCC. CCA, uh, the Competitive Carriers Association, the Consumer Electronics Association, 
and CTIA, the Wireless Association, as well as a broadcaster group called the Expanding Opportunities for a Broadcasters Coalition, a group of broadcasters that's seeking to sell their stations. And they've all lined up behind the FCC and will be filing in support of the agency. Um, so the FCC will have to work, or the courts will have to work through that uh, that appeal, or those appeals, um, one would think, before the FCC would uh, want to move forward with its auction. So there are a lot of balls in the air. They'll have these seven proceedings that they'll need to work through. They'll have the appeals. Plus, I, I almost hate to mention it, we have 31 petitions for recon of the incentive auction order, which is a lot. Yeah. And a lot of those are are discrete issues. There are, some of them are, I missed the deadline for having a construction permit, and I'd like a waiver. So it's almost more of a, or, or you should modify that deadline, but it's more of the nature of a waiver, kind of one-off type considerations. Uh, a few of them are more fundamental about how the, how the rules are structured and whether uh, the rules should be changed to accommodate different types of interest that the FCC may not have prioritized in its first go-round. Yeah, yeah. So they'll have to deal with all those petitions for reconsideration, too. Yeah, I guess in general, I mean, how has the FCC done so far? I mean, obviously, Wheeler has been uh, at the forefront of this. He's really been, you know, he's, he was at the recent CCA show, CTA show, uh, you know, talking about this topic, uh, the importance of this. Uh, he's been, uh, seems like, pretty busy to, uh, trying to get broadcaster support on this as well. Uh, obviously, these, these recent lawsuits are perhaps throwing a little bit of a spanner in, in, the, in the works there. Uh, but it does seem like the FCC, at least with, with Wheeler, is really trying to get this thing moving. And there's, it does seem like there's lots of kind of outside influences that have been uh, cropping up, whether it's uh, from outside or even internally at the FCC, uh, to kind of trip up some of the proceedings here. Uh, I guess what's, what's your view on how the FCC has done in kind of getting this thing moving? I, I think it's moving along pretty well. And when you think about the complexity of the auction, I think that they're managing that complexity very well. One thing that I think has been especially helpful for the FCC to have done is this week they released a packet of information for broadcasters that presented a very complex auction in a very clear and concise fashion. And so there's a, a detailed, I want to say, set of 60 slides that not only explain the auction but give some ballpark prices to broadcasters of what they might expect. And obviously prices will start high and they'll go lower but the FCC points out that a broadcaster can can pull the plug at any time and, and say, uh, no, the price has gone too low, I'm walking away. And I think that they're getting that message out there that this really is an opportunity to assess where they are in the business and see whether there's a better offer on the table. Because what I think may not be entirely understood beyond the you know the handful of consultants and economists and engineers and lawyers that are involved in the proceeding is that broadband is different and it's very hard to configure the spectrum in a way that is nicely paired mm -hmm. that could be standardized all across the country so that we can buy devices at scale for, for low prices and and is uh, consistently um, cleared all all around uh, in discrete geographic licenses. If we can't get that, there's not a lot of value to be had. The FCC is probably the largest incumbent in the 600 band. They hold all the white space between the broadcast stations. So what, what the FCC now can do is to package this in a way that's really attractive to broadband providers, and that's going to command a lot of value for broadcasters. And I think any broadcaster has got to look seriously at participating in the auction as an alternative. Many may choose not to do it, but it's it is a once in a lifetime opportunity, as the FCC has yeah. taken great pains to say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it seems like to you, from the broadcaster's point of view, I mean, you know, again, with the NAB uh, lawsuit, I mean, obviously, you know, they have a certain point of view of what they want to see happen, but but yeah, you're right. I mean, it does come down to kind of the individual broad broadcasters deciding what they want to do here, and you know, obviously, it seems like for the for the for the for the auction to be successful, it's going to need a lot of support or a lot of participation from these broadcasters. So it does seem like the FCC is kind of walking that fine line between, uh, you know, using a carrot and a stick kind of thing here, where it's trying to you know make sure that they're involved in this, uh, but not being uh, too aggressive to perhaps turn them off of the process as well, too. I mean, that was one fascinating thing about the broadcast packet that went out this week was that you don't necessarily need a, every broadcaster. In fact, you don't need every broadcaster to participate. Uh, both AT&T and T-Mobile filed studies that say, you know, participation can be 
as few as a few hundred stations, and that could result in very meaningful clearing. And I think the FCC's packet does a good job of showing that it's not just about New York and LA and Chicago, it's about these secondary and tertiary markets who become very important to clear channels because of the daisy chain of broadcast stations that stretch well outside of major markets. And so even if you're in, if you're a broadcaster and you're in a secondary or tertiary market, there is still a great opportunity and it's those broadcasters that can in many ways unlock a lot of value that's going to be available in the broadband auction for the 600 megahertz band. Yeah, great point, you're right. In, in that package that came out, you're right, they did mention uh, specifically that you know it's going to be those second tier markets that could generate perhaps the most revenue uh, for for some of these uh, broadcasters out there, you know, so that's that's going to be an important part to get them involved involved as well. So, uh, Im important part of it there. Well, and obviously, you know, over the next month, you know, kind of like you mentioned, in, in these kind of seven steps here, uh, obviously these are big things that are going on, but a lot of them also, uh, you know, as reading through some of this, uh, a lot of these issues have been kind of postponed, maybe once, maybe several times. Uh, just I guess that kind of is the nature of the proceedings. Uh, I mean, do you, do you think that the FCC is still on track to get through? Uh, these seven important points that you guys have kind of brought up that need to be kind of worked through over the next uh, month or month or so? <laughs> it's it's a lot to bite off. Yeah. I think it's still feasible to get to a point where it's mid-2015 and we have an auction. And there's always a lot of noise. I think every major auction leading up to it, even every minor auction, there's always noise. There's always a lot of proceedings. There's always the last-minute filing and the, and the debate about interference. But it's in the nature of a deadline to provoke a lot of activity. And so I think we're going to see more activity before we actually get there. Uh, will it slip? I, I don't know, but it is possible for them to work through this. And we're going we're gonna to see all kinds of fun. It wouldn't be surprising if we saw more, uh, more activity, a new proceeding, some kind of offshoot, and all that's, I think, par for the course. Yeah, and of course, too, there's also an auction coming up uh, yeah, next month as well that the FCC is going to have to uh, conduct while this is all going on, too. I mean, obviously, they've got enough resources to handle that, but that'll kind of add a little bit of uh, extra complexity, I'm guessing, to the, to the mix as well. Right, and yeah, that AWS3 auction is interesting because for a lot of players, that's constraining their ability to talk among themselves, and, and that because of the collusion rules, their li rules limiting how much you can communicate among other bidders. Um, and that might actually afford the opportunity, the FCC, the opportunity to kind of nail down some of these issues in that quiet period <laughs> during the auction. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Well, I mean, obviously, like you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, they're still looking at that mid-2015, and the FCC is still talking about that. That's kind of still been uh, the goal. I guess it's nice to have a goal out there. Uh, it did seem like at the recent uh, you know, CCA and CTA events, you know, talking to different people there from the, from the D.C. area, uh, that, that's still, you know, looked at as a goal, but, you know, some were perhaps thinking that maybe late 2015 even that might happen. But, but again, you're, you're kind of still thinking that a, that a mid-2015 date for all this is still still uh, doable, still feasible at this point? I'll say it's still feasible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whether you can get there or not from where we are, I, I don't know. But it, it, is, it is something that is feasible. Yeah. And the an important thing, I mean, the thing about this auction, too, is, I mean, it's important, obviously, to get Spectrum out there for, for broadband usage. But... I think one of the FCC commissioners even mentioned recently that this is going to kind of set the precedent going forward for other auctions uh, beyond this auction. I mean, obviously, uh, Spectrum is becoming, you know, more and more scarce, you know, freeing up Spectrum. And so uh, to get more Spectrum freed up for wireless broadband uh, could perhaps take this sort of incentive type of uh, process going forward. So this is really kind of set perhaps a precedent for how these things work going, going forward. Yeah, I think whatever we do here will set a precedent for all kinds of other auctions because there are a lot of incumbents out there and not all of them are deployed efficiently and not all of them are broadband capable uh, and if this works this could be a model for a much more efficient configuration of a whole number of different bands. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting to watch. Like you said, over the next over the next month here, it's going to be interesting to see how the FCC handles these immediate concerns, and then there's always you know the the court proceedings, and like you said, things tend to pop up on these uh, almost on a daily, weekly basis. So uh, the FCC is going to be very busy, it seems, uh, over the short term and midterm, uh, just to kind of work through all the processes here. So it'll be interesting to watch how this all all kind of plays out. I'm sure it'll keep you guys busy there in DC uh, as well, for for sure too. Uh, well, we hope so, but uh, you know there there are definitely quite a few issues to work through. But uh, I think the the FC has the capacity to do it, and they brought together a really talented team to get it done. 
Yeah. yeah. And again, with Wheeler really championing this, yeah, that's good to have kind of a leadership there that's really pushed kind of, you know, uh, make or break his, his uh, you know, what, what, what we look back at as, as tenure here. But this is obviously for him, it seems, a pretty important aspect for him to kind of make sure this gets handled uh, successfully, uh, for, you know, for, for, for everybody involved. I, I think that's right. I, I think between this, net neutrality, he's got a lot of make or break uh, decisions ahead of him. There are a lot of momentous decisions ahead of him, but this is certainly among them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, hey, Trey, we definitely appreciate the insight today on this topic. And again, as this kind of rolls through, I'm sure... Uh, things will pop up, and hopefully we can touch base again on this topic. I know it's a subject that uh, a lot of people perhaps get a little tired of, or, or you know, kind of get lost in some of the the minutia of it. But again, it's one of those you know processes that uh, every wireless operator is 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 really interested in. I mean, obviously, this is very important for their future. Uh, broadcasters are going to be really really interested in this. So it's a topic that uh, definitely is worth worth watching going forward. So we definitely appreciate the uh, the time and insight today. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you, Dan. Great. All right.